Good morning. Hey guys, good morning. Welcome to Port City Community Church. I'm so excited to see all of you guys here this morning. It is nine o'clock on a summer Sunday and you guys are here and I hear the waves are good. And so bravo. We're excited that you guys are here and, uh, and ready to be in this place this morning. I hear that the Fuse group got there safely. Um, so if any of you have high school students or you know high school students and leaders, we can know that they're there. Um, I also know that last night I was um, messaging Dennis Huffam about some information, and he wrote me back and said, we're about to start the first session, and it was nine o'clock at night. Okay, so I was getting ready to go to bed. So I'm just saying yay for them. We can be praying for all those students, the high schoolers, um, and all the students and the leaders who are there now. I'm sure they're having a blast, and they made it, and that is very exciting. So uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm part of the staff here. And if today is your very first time, then welcome. We are really glad that you decided to come and check it out. We have a great area called What's Next, and we meet over in the space called the gallery, which is right beside the cafe. And What's Next has information about the church. So if this is your first time and you're just kind of curious about who we are, or if you've been coming to Port City for a long time, and you're just wondering what your next step is, I would love for you to come in there right after the service. I'll be there with a couple volunteers and other staff, and we're not going to harass you with anything. We just want to get to know you and kind of find out what it is that you're looking for and help you get more plugged in. We've got some cool stuff going on this summer and a lot of really cool stuff happening in the fall, like different groups and events and things like that. Um, So be sure to stop in there in the gallery on your way out today. We do have something really neat coming up um, in a couple of weeks for the men, called Relevant. Now, since this is an event for men, I have not been before, um, but my husband has gone plenty of times, and I asked him a little bit about it just to see kind of what to tell you guys about it. And he said it's just a really great opportunity for the guys at the church to gather around. Um, They do spend some time worshiping, and then they get to hear from a speaker and learn some really practical biblical truths. And, um, And then they actually get to talk about it in a really laid back setting. And he said that the stuff that they take away from that time, it could be from the speaker, it could be from the conversations that you're able to have, has really influenced him not only at home in our marriage, um, but also in his workplace and in our community and then obviously here at the church. And so if you're a guy here, I would love um, to invite you to that. It is on Monday, July the 16th at 7 p.m. There is no cost, but we do ask that you register, and you can do that on our new website at pc3wilmington.org, or you can just come into the gallery right after this, and we'll help you get all registered and that kind of thing. Um, So this summer, we have been having a great time. We've been in a series called Summer Playlist. So if you guys have been around, you've gotten to hear from different pastors and speakers that we've had, and it's been awesome. We've had so much fun. And today we're really excited because we have a guy named Carlos Whitaker here this morning. And a lot of you have have been following him on social media. You've read his books. I know you're really excited that he's here. Mike's going to come out and kind of intro him in just a little bit. And then in the next, for the next two Sundays, we're going to have Stuart Hall. And I know that y'all love Stuart too. And so we are just really going to continue the fun and have a great, great continued on in the summer playlist. Um, We are going to have an acoustic set. As you can tell behind me, we are missing some of the normal instruments. And I'm really excited about it. It's something different. It's a little bit more laid back. So we're going to have Mike and Gia and Lee and his wife Janelyn up here leading us. So we're really, really looking forward to that. But before they get started, why don't you guys stand up, look around and say hello to someone standing beside you. Thanks.
31 says, the Lord our God will never leave us or forsake us. Come on, we can praise him because he's faithful. His love endures forever. His mercies are new every morning. So let's sing to him. Come on.
fortress for the weak, the strength that carries me when I am on my knees. The cross reminds my heart to trust your faithfulness and love will always be enough. that way today but it took me weeks of sadness to realize how desperately I needed to run to God so if you're in that place today I want to encourage you to run to God because guys he is for you and he is with you he gave up everything to have a relationship with you he wants us to come out of our messy darkness he wants to bring us into his light so today we're gonna sing just to remember how much he loves us and everything that he's done for us.
just so grateful for you and your presence here today and your love for us. We love to sing that you're a beautiful, wonderful God and that you are powerful. And that power lives with us, God. You are for us. You are fighting for us. We're so grateful for Jesus that he gave up his life so that we could have a relationship with you, God, so that we could have a life of hope and of purpose. Even when nothing else makes sense, God, we have you. We can run to you. Thank you for being that solid foundation for us. It's so sweet to sing your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and sing. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And we're gonna invite the host team to come around and receive our offering. Good morning. How you guys doing? I love this uh, summer series we've been doing, and I mostly love it because every Sunday morning, I don't feel like I'm going to throw up uh, when I wake up. So uh, I get to come and introduce all the people who are feeling like that today. I hope y'all enjoyed my younger brother last week. Did y'all enjoy him? Okay, good. Um, I'm really excited about today. This is a friend of mine. I've actually known about him for a lot longer. I met him uh, earlier this, uh, I guess, uh, this year, last year. We went to uh, India together. And uh, Carlos Whitaker has written a great book. Uh, it's called Kill the Spider. And uh, you'll hear why in just a minute. But I think this is, you know, I, I said it's going to be a treat because I think you'll enjoy uh, him. But I know it's going to be a treat for our church. I think it's going to be very challenging and very freeing. And I'm excited uh, about what we're going to hear as we learn how to not just sort of deal with the, uh, the, the symptoms of the sin problem that we face, but we really learn how to deal with with the root. And I think for a lot of us here, I've been through this process. It's a very freeing thing. I think it'll be challenging, but I also think um, that God wants to do something in your life that will free you uh, from what it is that may be the thing that keeps you from moving forward. So I'm excited uh, for us to hear this this morning. So I want you to welcome with me, Carlos Whitaker. Carlos, thank you so much. Yeah, man. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Oh, I'm so happy to be with you guys. Um, been looking forward to this. Uh, not everywhere does my wife want to come with me when I go speak. Um, but she was looking at the schedule and uh, of course she's here. And actually she's not here, she's at the beach right now. Um, <laughs> And so um, we're, we're just really excited to, to be here. My wife's excited. She'll be here at the, uh, at the 11 o'clock service. But um, gosh, could anybody in here just use a sliver of hope today? Can you just say amen? amen. Oh, oh, lots of you. That's, that's so good. I could too. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How is it that we can step one step closer to hope? What does it look like? I do want to correct uh, one thing that Pastor Mike said that is incorrect. My name is not Carlos. It is Carlos. <laughs> so if, uh, if you could, with your, your, your best North Carolina rolling R accent, just give me a good morning, Carlos. Good morning, Carlos. Ooh, that was bad. That was very Southern. <laughs> uh, that's okay. That, that, that really is. We are going to be talking about, yes, freedom and hope and what is it going to look like for us to step into that. I, um, 
I was, I, w- I was born into a, in, into a family. I was born in Pico Rivera, East Los Angeles. My father was the pastor of Primera Iglesia Bautista, first bilingual Baptist church in Pico Rivera. He would preach his sermons in English and in Spanish. Uh, the same message. So he'd translate himself. So it, it was actually really amazing to, and it's amazing to hear him do that. He says one thing in English, they'll say it in Spanish, and it's, it's amazing. But for me, I just thought it was really long. Like the sermons were <laughs> twice as long. And I, I grew up in the, in, in the church, I grew up every week hearing my dad talk about the hope of Jesus and, and, and what it looks like. And I know for, for many of us, um, you hear these messages of hope and some of you guys may be sitting in some pretty hopeless situations. You know, there, there's different seasons of life. Some people are in fantastic, incredible seasons. And I think sometimes the church forgets to talk about those seasons. So those seasons, it's, it's great sometimes to just celebrate where the Lord has you, if he has you in a blessed season. And I'd say about half of you guys are probably there. And maybe the other half of you aren't in an incredible season. You're in a season of struggle. You're in a season where it's like, gosh, when is this going to end? And when am I going to get over the hump to that incredible season that I keep reading about in the Bible? And there's, there's, there's a beautiful thing about being in a very blessed season, but there's a danger in being in a very blessed season. And let, let me tell you the danger. If you're in a great season of life, the danger is that we begin to somehow believe that we are somehow responsible for the blessing in our life. You see, that's where it gets dangerous. When things are getting good, somehow we start thinking, oh, look at me. I've got this Christian thing figured out. I've got this follower of Jesus thing figured out. Look, I've got it down. All my hard work is paying off in the blessings in my life. But let me tell you something. You couldn't be further from the truth because scripture does not say every good and perfect gift comes from your hustle. This is not what the Bible says. You see, the Bible says every good and perfect gift, every, not some, every good and perfect gift comes from God, comes from above. And when we're in a season of blessing, gosh, it's so easy for us to somehow believe that we are responsible for the goodness in our life. You know, I I was in a season of, of blessing in my life about seven years ago, everything was going perfect. I mean, everything I was touching was turning to gold. Gold, gold, everything. I mean, even the mistakes I was making was working out in life. Like I couldn't mess up bad enough. I would mess up so bad and then that mess up would turn to gold. And it was incredible and I started believing, hey, look at me, I can do no wrong. I, I I was actually, just to give you just a little glimpse into what I'm talking about, I was in, my car with my wife and kids, we were on our way to an Atlanta Braves game. We were living in Atlanta at the time. And my kids were in the backseat of the car and they were singing that Beyonce song. It came on the radio. All the single ladies, you guys know that song? All the single ladies, all the single ladies. That, that, that one. If you like it, then you should put a ring on it. <laughs> and my kids at the time were, were, I think like seven, five, and two and a half. And my, my two daughters were singing it and my son, son was singing it too. And I, and I thought it was really cute. So I pulled out my phone to record them so I could send it to my mom in LA because I thought it was really cute. Well, halfway through the song, as I'm recording it, I decided to tell my son that he is in fact not a single lady. He was two and a half. The devastation that shook him from his core. He started, Wah! and I'm recording it. And I'm thinking, this is really funny. So instead of sending the video to my mom, I decided to put it on this brand new website called YouTube. (laughs) 24 hours later, let me show you guys what happened. Watch this. The Whitaker family of Atlanta was in the car just singing along to Beyonce's hit song, Single Ladies. And then the family fun took an unexpected turn. You're not a single lady, buddy. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're a single lady. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I love you, buddy. I was just kidding. I was just kidding. 
get it. You can do it. <laughs> buddy, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, buddy. You're a single lady, okay? Okay? Here we go. If you like it, you got to put a ring on it. Sorry. I'm a okay. Sure, sure. Seven point four million people overnight saw me making my son cry. CBS Early Show. Good morning, America. Anderson Cooper, Wolf Blitzer, Fox and Friends, Ellen, Jimmy Kimmel. Everybody's calling me. And all the producers are calling me, asking me to, asking to speak to the horrible father that made his son cry. <laughs> Seven months after I made my son cry, my family got flown from Atlanta to Los Angeles, picked up in a limousine, got driven to the Staples Center. We walked down a red carpet. I was given on national television the People's Choice Award by Queen Latifah herself for viral video of the year. I won an award for making my son cry. I could do nothing wrong. Everything was going right. I'm telling you everything. Two weeks after this video went viral, my first record came out. I was doing music at the time. It went number one on iTunes because this video. Like, I'm telling you, when I was in this season of blessing, I thought it was all me, look at me. And it's such a dangerous space to sit in because what ended up happening is the enemy will come in and start whispering in your ear, oh, this is all you. You've got this all under control. You've got this so under control that you know that thing you've always wanted to try, but you know you shouldn't do it, but I promise you, give it a shot. So I'm standing in light, but then I started believing my own hype and I would step over into darkness for just a second, like, like for like an hour and then hop back over into light. And I was like, Hey, I pulled it off. Like nothing happened. Like I, I stepped into sin and then I came over into light and I'm, I'm still fine. So what would I do? I would step into sin for a little bit longer, maybe five hours. And then hop back over here. Hey, nobody found out. Nobody's hurt. Everything's fine. And the more and more I would step from light into darkness, the longer I would stay in darkness. And I'm still standing on stages in front of thousands of people, leading them in my songs. People were still coming to know Jesus. The Lord was still using me. And I was just standing in darkness longer and longer and longer. And I kept beginning to think that I could keep dancing between light and dark. And since it was not having, quote unquote, an effect on people around me, I began to believe it wasn't having an effect on my soul. But let me tell you the truth. Standing in darkness and then going to light and going to darkness and going to light was absolutely destroying everything inside of me. And I began to believe my own hype that I could dance back and forth between dark and light and dance until one day I walked out into my living room. We were living in a small condo in Nashville, Tennessee at the time. And I'll never forget, I smelled dinner, was cooking, and I walked to the kitchen to ask my wife, uh, what are you cooking? It smelled amazing. And I remember walking out there and the, um, the stove was still on and the, the, the sauce was still boiling, but my wife was in the kitchen. And the kids were in the back. I was, just, I was just with them. And I was like, hey, kids, you know where mom is? And no. And then I went to, to the back patio and, and my heart started to pound just a little bit. And I ran to the front door and I saw that the minivan was gone. And I immediately spun around to look for my laptop in my backpack. And it was gone as well. And in one second, in one moment, I was no longer dancing between light and darkness. I was drowning in the darkness of my sins. And life as I knew it was over. I had been discovered. My deepest, darkest sins were now in the hands of my wife. And I sprinted back to the bedroom and I grabbed my kids and I put them on the sofa. This, friends, was seven months after that video went viral. Only a few months after we won an award on national television. 
And I grabbed my kids and I put them on the bed and I looked at them in the eyes and through my tears, I said, Daddy's made a mistake. And I don't know what's about to happen. But I love you. And just know that everything's going to be okay. And as, and, I, and as I began to cry, and my kids were so terrified in front of me, they'd never seen their dad confessing something like this to them, and they're so little. And there's a pounding on my front door. And I go to the front, and it's my best friend, Blake Bergstrom, and his wife, Allie. And they said, Heather knows everything. She wants the kids. It's over. And friends, so began the darkest season of my life. I lost my family. That family you saw, gone because of decisions I made to try and dance between light and darkness, not realizing I was drowning in darkness. Dark season. I move out of my home. My wife, I, I, I tried to, I, I was trying. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm going to fix my sin. I'm going to try. I'm trying to stop sinning. I'm trying. No, I'll never forget. She wrote me a, a love letter, actually. And the, and the letter was filled with, she kept saying, this love for the Carlos I once knew. But I don't know that Carlos anymore. And our marriage is over. I will never say a bad thing about you in front of the kids, but divorce papers are being filed. And she was done. And about three weeks later, I, I, was, I was at my friend Blake's house, living there. And I'll never forget, it was the dark, all the darkness in my life. I felt it so dark in that bedroom. And I remember screaming at God. God, I tried to stop sinning. I tried with everything inside of me to stop this habit. Why didn't you help me? Look what I've done. I've destroyed my family. I've destroyed my job. I've destroyed my life. Everything is over, God. And I was so mad at God. Friends, for four months, my wife didn't say a word to me loneliest season of my life. But I'll never forget, in this dark season of feeling so far away from God, opening my Bible finally, and I, when I open it straight to the scripture I'd never read before, the scripture is this, 1 Peter 5.10. Now the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory. Okay, stay here. If you're in a dark season, I need you to listen to this. In Christ Jesus, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. Four incredible promises. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory, will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. And that's the greatest scripture on the planet if there was a period right there. But it says something else. What does it say? After you have what? Suffered. You see, there's promises here. Promises that you will be restored, established, strengthened, and supported. But there's also a promise that suffering happens in this life. But there's one little caveat at the end after suffering. It says, suffered a little. Mm. A little. And I'll tell you what, in the middle of this suffering in my life, it did not feel like a little. It felt like a lot. It felt like everything. It was all I could do to get up in the morning. But this promise from God that we will be restored, established, strengthened, and supported, I, I remember thinking to myself, I don't feel close to God. How in the world can this happen? Here's the good news. First glimpse of good news in my story. The gospel has nothing to do with your feelings. Let me say that again. If you feel far away from God right now, that's fine. Because the truth of the gospel, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you feel. Truth is still truth in spite of how we feel. So I was feeling far from God, but this was still true. And let me tell you, friends, what felt like a lot, I'll never forget. The day I got a text from my wife, I was texting her every single day for four months. Little did I know, she wouldn't even read them. She was just deleting him. Well, one day, four months later, I get a text back. Okay, we'll have coffee. That's all it was. We showed up for coffee. And I'll never forget walking in and seeing her eyes. 
And there was the first glimpse and sliver of hope that I found. And it wasn't overnight, and it took lots of therapy and counseling. But our God is a God of restoration and redemption. And today, my wife is at the beach in Wilmington with me because God restores and he heals and he renovates and he does these great things. And there's hope. There's hope for all of us. So spoiler alert, that family that I lost, we're back together. And things are incredible. And it wasn't overnight. And listen, restoration is not going to look the same for everybody. I'm not saying every marriage that falls apart is going to come back together. But what I am saying is restoration will happen in your heart. Jesus will come in and help restore these things. But what we have to figure out, we have to get to, is we have to finally get to a space where we let Jesus do the work in our life as opposed to us trying to roll up our sleeves and do the work ourselves. Because I was striving. Listen, I bought every single book on how to stop sinning. Like I listened to all the podcasts. I listened to all Mike's sermons. Like I, I was trying as good, much as I could to like stop sinning. And I just couldn't. And I kept going to, to I was going to therapy. I'm a big believer in therapy. And, and my marriage began to heal. And I, my therapist, like I kept going back week after week and I was getting close. I could tell, like, I was like 90% through my, my big sin issue. But I couldn't get over the hump. Like, I, I just couldn't seem to get over it. And I'll never forget, Mike looked at me. Um, I'm sorry, not Mike. Al, my therapist. And I was in therapy, and I said, Al, I, I've got to, I, I can't seem to get past it. How do I get over the hump? He goes, Carlos, let me tell you. What I see you doing in your life is you keep rubbing crap on your blessings. That's what he said. I was like, what? Excuse me? You're a Christian therapist. You're not supposed to say this. He's like, no, 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 no. Look, take a look at your life. You keep rubbing crap on your blessings. Every single time the Lord gives you a blessing, you rub crap on it. You have to figure out why. You feel unworthy of all the blessings God's given you. Subliminally, that's happening in your life. And I remember thinking, huh. So I go home. And on my way home, I decide to call my dad. My dad, he's a... He, he's a saint of a man. My father is, um, he, he, he's an immigrant from, from Colón, Panama. My, my grandparents sent him to America with $20 and a shoe shine kit in 1963. He showed up at LAX with a shoe shine kit and 20 bucks, shined shoes for a year, made enough money for one semester at LA Community College, got a scholarship to the next semester at LA Community College, ended up getting a full scholarship to UCLA. Now my dad's doctor for me, Augustine Whitaker, because in this country, we can pull things like that off and it's incredible. But I tell you this so you can understand that my father makes me feel so lazy. Like every time I, I look at the man's life and I'm like, oh, but he's a saint of a man, he's so wise. So I called him and I was like, hey dad, listen, my therapist, Al, keeps telling me that I keep rubbing crap on my blessings. He's like, oh, Carlitos, let me tell you why you rub crap on your blessings. <laughs> now, before I tell you why, what he told me, let me show you a picture of my father. This is actually a picture of my father, just so you see what, what a saint of a man he is. He, I mean, look at him. Like, I mean, you just see, I mean, he just looks like a saint already. And he's still alive, he's still kicking, but he's a saint. And, and, and so I, I know half of you guys are thinking right now, I... I know I've seen that man somewhere before. And you actually have, because this is also a picture of my father. My father, every time I pick up my phone, is <laughs> actually, every time I pick up my phone, I'm like, Dad! I send him that emoji every day. I don't even say anything to him. I just send him the emoji. <laughs> Listen, I, I, it's been an intense 10 minutes of storytelling, and I'm just giving you guys a laugh for just a second, right? So he goes, let me tell you a story. When I was in Panama, preaching my very first revival, Mr. Ramirez, the very first night of my revival, I was 18 years old. I gave the invitation to accept Jesus. And Mr. Ramirez gets up. Mr. Ramirez is 18 years old. She's been a Christian her whole life. She comes walking forward to the front. And she says, Pastor, can you please pray for me? And my, dad, my dad said, yeah, I'll pray for you. Pastor, can you please pray specifically that the Lord would clean the cobwebs from my life? So my dad said, oh, Okay. So we prayed. He said, that's very poetic. Lord, please clean the cobwebs from Mr. Ramirez's life. Night number two, Mr. Ramirez gets up again, Carlitos, and she walks to the front of the church. And she says, Pastor, can you pray again that the Lord clean the cobwebs from my life? And my dad said, I prayed that last night. She said, pray harder. <laughs> so my dad was like, okay, Jesus, ha! I pray, ha! Just give us some girth to my prayer. And I pray 
clean the carpet so Mr. Midas is life. <laughs> Amen. Carlitos, she leaves. The last night of the revival, Mr. Ramirez walks forward again. And I'm like, she's going to tell me he has done it. He finally cleaned the cobwebs. But no, with tears streaming down her face, she says, Pastor, can you pray one more time that the Lord would clean the cobwebs? And my dad said, he said, no. We've been praying the wrong prayer. Tonight, I will pray that he kills the spider. Carlitos, I've watched you your entire life, he said. Clean the cobwebs. You can no longer spend your time cleaning the cobwebs. You must find the root and kill the spider. Friends, I'd never heard my life more perfectly described. We are professional cobweb cleaners. It is what we're good at. And here's the reason why. Because it's a lot easier to clean the cobwebs than to kill the spider. I don't know about you, but I, I, I make my son go kill the spiders in my house. Like, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want anything to do with those things. And, and more than likely, we're just cleaning the cobwebs. But we have to get to the root. So I began the good work of finding my spider and killing it. And I've ended up writing a book called Kill the Spider. And let me give us a definition so we can really quickly get to this point that I believe can free so many of us. You see, I believe that a spider is this. Now listen, let's pay attention. School time. A spider is an agreement you have made with a lie. Say that again. You see, this is what we have to get to. Spider is an agreement you've made with a lie. This is not easy to get to. But a cobweb, on the other hand, a cobweb is a medicator that brings false comfort to that lie. Let me say that again. A cobweb is a medicator that brings false comfort to that lie. You see, this, this is what sells. This, if you walk down the Barnes and, uh, the, the self-help aisle at Barnes and Nobles, it's the cobweb aisle. Like all the things, all the medicators that are medicating our lies. That's what we deal with in America. That's where we spend all of our money. But that is never going to fix the problem. So let's get really specific, okay? If a spider's an agreement you've made with a lie and a cobweb is a behavior or a medicator that brings false comfort to the lie, let's get there. Let's talk about some of the loud, ugly cobwebs, right? Those cobwebs that, that have destroyed so many families. Alcohol, okay? That is a cobweb, okay? Alcohol, I've seen it destroy so many people's lives, but clue alert, the problem is not the alcohol. Now, the alcohol can become a problem, but the reason why the alcohol is a problem is because the alcoholic believes a lie about themselves. You see, cobweb, spider. Cobwebs the alcohol. You think by just throwing all the alcohol away in your house or putting a lock on it, that's going to solve the problem? No. You're still you. The problem's still there. Ah, how about this one? How about pornography? Artificial intimacy. Oh, well, if I put a a porn blocker on my phone, maybe give my spouse my password, all these things, then I've, I've, I've solved the problem. No. You've just cleaned the cobwebs. You've just fixed the medicating behavior. You haven't gotten to the root, the lie you believe that somehow you cannot find true intimacy in Jesus or with your spouse. You see, that's the spider. You have to get to that lie. When you kill that lie, pornography goes away. Infidelity. You're just medicating a lie you believe. That's all that is. Food. I'm going to touch everybody here, okay? Food, what, what, what about food? Like food's a great thing. God made food for us. But so many of us use food as a cobweb. It's just a medicating behavior that brings you false comfort to a lie. So it's, for some people, it's too much food. For some people, it's too little. And we think, oh, I'm just gonna go, to, go, go on a diet. And if my body looks a certain way, oh, then, then everything's gonna be fixed. No, you believe a lie. You've agreed with the lie that the enemy has told you that your identity is based on what your body looks like. Got to get to that. Cobweb, spider. We starting to get it? Cobweb, spider. But let's let's not just talk about those those ugly cobwebs. What about some pretty cobwebs? 
What about like, like uh, the, you hard workers, your corner office? Oh, if I just make my way up in the company, get that corner office, get my name plate on the door. That's just a medicator for something you believe about yourself, that your identity is based on your title. My wife, my wife, she lets me share this all the time. She talks about how she, I mean, literally, if you walk into my house, it looks like Pinterest is thrown up all over it. It is beautiful. She's an incredible, like, like artist. She, our, our house is decorated. Like she throws these great parties. But she told me one day, she goes, Carlos, that's actually a cobweb for me. Throwing these parties and having a beautiful home, that's a medicator to a lie that I believe that if I don't throw these parties, nobody's gonna love me or show up. You see? We all have cobwebs. All of us, every single person in here does. And all those cobwebs are rooted by a lie we believe. So it's really easy to find these cobwebs. It's a lot more difficult to find the spider. If you don't know what your cobweb is, ask your family. They'll tell you. It's really easy, okay? But a spider, on the other hand, you can't just ask your family. In order to find out your spider, we're going to have to literally hear from the Holy Spirit. That's how. That's how you do it. And I know a lot of you guys are thinking, well, I don't, I've never heard from God. Like, oh, no, you have. It's just a matter of deciphering his voice. So, if we want to get to our spider, we've got to hear from God. So how do we do that? Step one, we hear from God when we pay attention. Say pay attention. Okay. I believe God's speaking to us all the time. We just have to lower the volume of life and the volume of God goes up. All the time, the Lord is speaking to us. I think he's speaking to us in whimsical ways all the time. People call things in life coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences. My, my, my wife and I were on our way home from Ireland when I first started stepping into this hearing from God thing a few years ago. And we're on our way home. And you guys know when you're on your way to a trip, like overseas, you're super excited. When you're on your way home, you're super miserable because you know there's bills waiting at home. Like you've been living this fake life, right? In your little bubble. And so we were both like, oh my gosh, like we're going home. And we're at, we're at P.F. Chang's in the Detroit County Airport. And I'll never forget it. I, I decided to try to make my wife laugh to lighten the mood a little bit. And I said, hey, babe, let me tell you a story about um, once I was leading worship and my friend Marcus, who's my percussion player, uh, he, f- he forgot his egg shaker, you know, a little egg shaker. So we ran to Guitar Center to go buy an egg shaker and they didn't have an egg shaker. They just had a shaker in the shape of a banana. So we're playing, I'm playing worship and <laughs> Marcus is shaking this banana. The whole worship set and the end of the service, this woman comes forward and she's like, worship is great. But why was your friend shaking a banana the whole set? And I thought that it was a funny story, like seven of you guys. <laughs> my wife was like the rest of you. She was just kind of like, ah, it's not really funny. It's like, babe, banana shaking is that fun? No. So the waitress, she brings our check. She puts it on the table. There's a, there's, a, there's a fortune cookie on my check. I open up my fortune. I've opened up, I don't know, thousands of fortune cookies in my life. There's one word on my fortune. What word is on my fortune? Banana! <laughs> but freaking Nana! It's on my fortune! What? So I stand up and I'm looking, I think I'm on candid camera or Ashton Kutcher's gonna come running out. I'm like, how did I show her? I was like, oh, look, banana. And she starts dying laughing. She, she thinks the Holy Spirit's funny, but not me. I took, I took that home and I actually stuck that, 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 that fortune in a frame and I put it next to my bed. It's next to my bed because I wanted to wake up every single day and realize that we serve a God that is a whimsical God. This is not a coincidence. I'm telling you guys, I've opened thousands of fortune cookies. I've never told the story where the central theme was a banana. Come on. Come on. And I just want to be reminded every single day to pay attention. All the time, he's speaking to us. But we're so busy, right? Volume, the volume of life is so loud that we, we miss it. And if you start to pay attention, he's going to start to help you develop and discover what these lies are you've made agreements to. So that's step one. We hear from God, we pay attention, but we also hear from God when we ask questions. Say, ask questions. We have to ask specific questions. And here's the deal. For many people that have never heard from God or think they've never heard from God, we pray very vague prayers. Because we think if we cast a wide enough net, maybe at some point, like maybe a little bit of the prayer will get answered here. And we're like, oh, God answered my prayers. But what if, what if you start asking God specific questions? Oh, now your mind is going to start getting blown away. You see, we have to ask God specific questions. 
I need you to ask him, God, what is the lie I've made an agreement to? That specifically. Write it down. Pray it every day. Ask him. I promise he will be specific. We don't serve a vague God. We serve a very specific God. When, when tragedy happens in our life, our prayers go from vague to specific, right? Like when there's sickness in our family, we suddenly are specific praying people. But then when things are good, we start getting vague again. I was with a friend of mine, Marcus, in Nashville. The same Marcus, that, that was my banana shaking, Marcus. And he, we were having coffee and he was like, hey, Carlos, tell me a little bit about, about this specific praying thing. I don't think I've ever heard from God. I said, oh, no, you've heard from God. I said, well, let's practice right now. He goes, practice? I said, yeah. I said, I want you to ask God where we should go to lunch. He was like, like that specific? I was like, yeah. Ask God right now, where, where should me and Carlos go to lunch? And he was looking at me like I was crazy. He's like, all right. So he looked straight up as if that's like, you know, the way. He's like, God, where should me and Carlos go to lunch? And then I let him sit there uncomfortably for like a minute. He was just like, he's looking up. He's looking around, he picked up his phone. Maybe God would text him. I don't know why he looked at his phone, but he's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't hear anything. I said, well, are you sure? He's like, I don't, I don't hear, I don't hear anything. Like, what does his voice sound like? Marcus, like, what's he supposed to sound like? I said, well, do you feel anything? He's like, oh, feelings? Now we're talking about feelings? Yeah, I feel things, but how do I know if that's God or my stomach? Like, I don't know. Like, what do I, I said, what do you feel? He's like, oh, yeah, he was so stressed out about hearing from God. He goes, well, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like we should go to the Thai restaurant over in Titan Stadium parking lot. We live in Nashville now. So I said, okay, let's, let's go there. He's like, but what's it got? I was like, I don't know. You asked him. <laughs> so we head over to Thai Phuket to this restaurant and it was fine. We didn't have, Jesus didn't appear in the steam of my Thai chicken curry soup. Like <laughs> nothing crazy. We actually forgot that we'd actually asked God where we should go to lunch. It was fine. We leave. Marcus walks to his motorcycle. I walks to my minivan, different stages of life. And we're like, <laughs> we're about to go. And suddenly tearing out of Thai Phuket comes this man. I mean, running out. Hey, man. Hey, you guys. Hey, hey, hey. He's screaming. We're like, what? And so I immediately, I start thinking that I left my wallet in there, or my phone. He's like, hey, man, you. And he runs right up to Marcus. He goes, hey, man, you're going to think I'm crazy, man. You're going to think I'm so crazy. And we were both like, yeah. <laughs> man. Do you sometimes work on your laptop over at that coffee shop in 12 South called Frothy Monkey? Marcus was like, yeah. He's like, oh my God, man, I was in there just last week and I was reading my Bible and you walked in there and I felt like the Lord told me to pray for you, but I didn't. I didn't say a thing and I let you walk out and I never even thought about it again. And then you freaking walked into Typhoon Cat. And oh my God, man, I was watching the whole time, panicking. And then you walked out and the Lord was like, no, not twice. So I chased you out here <laughs> and I need to know, can I please pray for you? And Marcus's eyes got that big. And I left Marcus in that parking lot all by himself with that strange man and I drove away. <laughs> Marcus called me 10 minutes later, his voice trembling. He answers our specific questions. Friends, God answers your specific questions. If you just develop the faith enough to ask them, start asking specific questions, he'll give you a specific answer. So the specific question today is, what is the agreement I've made with the lie? He will answer exactly that. And here's the deal. Once he tells you what your spider is, what the agreement is you made with the lie, it's not hard to kill it. Okay, so in my book, The Killing the Spider, although it's called Kill the Spider, the killing part is like one page. Once you get there, because the hard part's finding it, you confess the lie, you reject the lie in the name of Jesus, and then you replace the lie. There it is. Spider's dead. Confess it, reject it, replace it. When you do that, the enemy's done. There's no more chains. Chains break, they fall, you're free. And yeah, sure, give that a hand because I'm telling you, when you've experienced that, it's incredible. But most people say, well, Carlos, like, how do I know it's really dead? I mean, I did it, but like, how do I know? How do I know I really killed it? Oh, scripture tells us. It tells us. Watch this. Romans 8, 6. For the mindset of the flesh is what? Death. 
But the mindset of the spirit is life and what? Now, here's the deal. This scripture, if we can leave it up for a second. I feel like most Christians put a period after life. We forget that there's more that God has for us. See, we think that for the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life, period. No, there's not a period after life. There's more than just life. Life and peace. And peace in scripture is defined as peace like a river. Scripture doesn't say peace is like a puddle. I feel like most, a lot of Christians for so much of my life, I, I wanted my peace to look like a puddle. Just completely still. That's not what peace is like. Peace is moving and it's flowing and it's carrying us towards the center of the gospel. There's another one. Romans, excuse me, John 10.10. 10. A thief comes only to steal, kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life. Is there a period after life? Say it out loud. No, there's not. There's life and what? Abundance. Guys, there's more than just life. Our goal as Christians isn't just to become a Christian and wait for heaven. Our goal is to become a Christian and bring heaven. That is possible and attainable here on earth. There's abundance. I used to struggle with anxiety and depression. For for many years of my life, I was so panic stricken, I couldn't leave my home for months. I was stuck and I was so mad at God again. And, And then finally I got a little bit better and I used to say things like, God's given me enough strength to deal with my anxiety. And you know what? That's half true. But God did just did, didn't just want to help me deal with my anxiety. See, God actually wanted to heal me fully from my anxiety and depression. And guess what? He did. I'm standing on the stage when I used to not even be able to leave my home. There is more than just life. There's abundance waiting for us. So do you know what it looks like? And we'll end with this. Understanding that Jesus did not die on a cross so you can just cope. So many of us just think, oh, I'm just gonna cope, cope till heaven. No, Jesus didn't die on a cross for you to cope. He died on a cross so you can be free and have breath and have abundance. My family and I were camping in the high Sierras last summer. And we were camping and we'll close with this. The uh, stars, if you've, ever, if you've ever gone camping up in the high Sierras in California, the stars, are, there's millions of stars up in the sky. And I, where I'm having this romantic time with my wife next to the fire, kind of like I put my arm around her and it's beautiful and the fire's crackling. And as I'm about to kind of get my move on, she goes, hey, hey, can you take a picture of the stars? I was like, oh, I said, a picture. Okay, I'll take a picture of the stars. So I grabbed my phone. She's like, no, 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 not with the phone. You can't get a picture of the stars with the phone. You need to go get our expensive camera, the fancy camera. So I went over and I got the expensive camera, the fancy camera, but there's all these buttons and dials on this camera. So if you don't know how to use a fancy camera, there's a mode that you put the camera on, which is what mode? Auto, auto right? So yeah, I put it on auto, a little square, green square, and I aimed that puppy at the sky and I took a picture just to kind of get it over with. I knew my wife wanted a picture of the stars, so I took a picture and I was like, huh. So I walked over to my wife and I was like, how's this picture? So if we could lower the lights for a second, I actually have the picture that I, that I, that I took. This is a picture that I took. So there's, I don't know, 20 stars. And my wife looked at me like, <laughs> no, I want the picture of the stars. Like the, the abundance of stars. And I was like, oh, but I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't know how to get that picture. No, 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 no. Well, call one of your friends that are photographers. So I called my friend Jeremy. He's like, I was like, Jeremy, I tried to take a picture of the stars, but I only got 20 and there's 20 million. He goes, oh, is it on auto mode? I was like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like, no, 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 you have to take it off of auto mode. In order to get to the abundance of the stars, you have to take it off of auto mode and you have to step into manual mode. But Jeremy, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do manual mode. Oh no, listen, let me tell you how. So you put it on manual mode, then you have to take the ISO and crank the ISO up to 12,000. Then you have to take the um, shutter speed and show the su- slow the shutter speed to 30 seconds where the shutter's wide open. Then you take the aperture and lower it from 5.4 to 1.2. Then you have to put it on a tripod because if you're holding it, it'll be blurry. And I just want a picture of the stars, man. <laughs> so complicated. And I tried and I failed. And I tried and I failed. And I tried and it was completely black. Worse than, it was completely white. And I tried, for 40 minutes I tried. And after 40 minutes of it being on manual mode, I finally took this picture right here. 
See, friends, listen. This is life with abundance, with moving the period after life over to abundance. This is a life when you kill your spider. This is how you're gonna know. But most of us are living our life in auto mode. Can we put the other picture up one more time? Most of us are living like this and we think this is all God has for us. Oh, there's some pretty stars. It's kind of a pretty picture. No, there is more that God has for you. If we can get that other picture up one more time, this is what God has for all of us when we finally break the agreement with the lie we've been bound with. And that's how you're gonna know that you've killed the spider. Let's pray. I pray, Jesus, that right now in this room, across every campus, that you begin to reveal specifically what the agreements are we've made with the lies. Lord, specifically speak through a friend, through a scripture, through a song, Lord, but be so specific. And may the miracles begin to happen today because we've finally broken the agreements with the lies. For it is by the blood of the cross, the power of your resurrection, that every single believer said amen. 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 Come on, won't you stand to your feet as we sing again? You are a fortress for the weak, the strength that carries me. When I am on my knees And the cross reminds my heart to trust Your faithfulness and love will always be enough You are a fortress for the weak The strength that carries me When I am Reminds my heart to trust Your faithfulness and love Will always be enough Oh, you are a fortress for the weak The strength that carries me When I am on my knees The cross reminds my heart i 
Pretty good, right? All right, Lee, thank y'all. Thank you guys. Um, what we just sang was a specific prayer, right? What we just sang was a specific prayer to give me faith to trust what you say. Carlos said, right? We confess, we repent, we replace. It sounds pretty easy, but he's right. Finding the spot or finding the lie is hard. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of availing ourselves and trusting what it is that God says about us and what He says about Himself to you right where you are. I hope that this will be, as we've been talking about this new thing and preparing ourselves, this will be a part of your journey as you seek to understand, you know, not just that God has came to give you life, but the kind of life that He has come to give you, that He has made available to you right where you are, no matter what it is that you've been through. We would love, like that's our mission, we would love to help you continue that journey. So as we get ready to dismiss, I want you to know, Carlos, uh, we've got a bunch of his books. Um, I like to read because it slows me down. I've been through it. I've found several spiders uh, from this process. It's a, it's a very freeing thing. And uh, they'll be out there and Carlos is out there. He'd love to meet uh, as many of you as he can uh, on the way out. And of course, we'll be down front with some of our pastoral staff. If there's anything we can help you with, we'll be honored to do that as well. Thank you guys so much. If you know someone who might need this message, we'll have another service at five o'clock tonight. Bring them back. We've got plenty of room for them, okay? See you guys next week. Thank you so much.